why do I call the ecological basis of Indian literature? I had this rather unconventional view that Indian history and everything we know about India is more or less dominated by what I call the landed culture. Today, we think the culture, the only culture of India because since colonialism, landed culture has become the more prominent culture because landed culture gives you the revenue the British people wanted. They did not like Indian trade anyway and they discouraged the trade and the pastoralism more or less very quietly disappeared. So three important strands of Indian culture are lost to us and only one remained in landed culture. That is when Ramayana becomes the national epic of India. Pardon me for saying that, it's not. There are other epics, equally national epics of India. And Sita became the role model for all Indian women. She was not until a certain point of time in Indian history. Since I am not much of a historian, I did not want to go into the history of it, but I want to go into the narratives, the epics and other narratives. Take the show a look at it. These narratives tell us there are three very important different cultures of India. One not really like the other. The first one, Ramayana. This is, of course, Arsha Sita's Ramayana. This I am saying is a landed epic. What do you mean by that? In a landed culture, you have to protect it to keep your land for yourself. It's not something you can put in your pocket and walk away. You have to fight for it. And the only hero in a landed culture who will fight a battle and die in the battle. That's one thing. Heroism in a land culture is people dying in battle for something. In fact, today, all our heroes we worship are those people who died in the battle. Statues are there for them. We have an eternal flame for them. All this comes from the land and culture idea. In fact, even Bhagavad Gita says, when Arjuna was wondering whether he should fight or not, Krishna was telling him, Ato va prapsis is swargam, jitva va se mahim. If you, if you die in the battle, you go to heaven. If you succeed, you become the king. What do you lose? Fight. That was what Krishna was telling Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita. This again is an idea of the landed culture. You should never show your back to the enemy in a battle. That idea came from the landed culture. You go to heaven when you die in the battle. Why? You know, Rambha is waiting there for you. You have the pleasure of having a company if you die in the battle. Never mind which side, which side you are fighting. If you run away from the battle, your own wife treats you as a woman. There's a story of Khadga Tikkana, Nadi Tikkana that translated Mahabharata. Is Khadga Tikkana, Tikkana of the sword. He goes to battle and runs away and comes home. And his mother and wife, both of them, treat him as a woman. They prepare a place for her bath, for his bath, and put turmeric there. Only women use turmeric when they take their bath. And when Tikkana, what is this? He said, look, we are three women in this, in this household. So, take a bath, like a woman. And mother gives him curdled milk instead of curd. You know what curdled milk? We call it broken milk. He says, why the milk is curdled? See? Your heroism is broken, so is the milk. So he was so humiliated that he goes back to battle, 
dies in the battle and when she body comes home his wife performs sati she dies under the funeral pyre along with a hero husband like the wife of a hero that was her pride you know in the ramayana i don't have to tell the story the sita was abandoned without a second thought let's go back to the idea of human in the land and culture land and culture <coughs> women are equated to land women are fertile land is fertile you protect your land same way you protect your women unless you protect the land and say this is my land the crop is not going to be your crop because there is nothing on the crop actually saying this is your crop same goes with children a son born of a wife if she is not protected properly who knows who son he is therefore it's always a problem if pregnancy is suspected it is the business of the woman to prove her innocence she is guilty until she is proved innocent go the other way you know proper law you are innocent unless you are proved guilty but that's not the case in the land culture a woman is guilty unless she proves herself to be innocent that's exactly what happened for rama and sita after the battle rama wants to see and sita wants to see rama sita is brought to him well decorated and rama looks at her and says i have done my duty by rescuing you from the enemy and avenging the insult to myself so the heroism is to protect the honor of my family not to save you from a kidnapper you should know that this war which was won by the heroic efforts of my friends was not for your sake we didn't fight the war for you i did not i did it to vindicate my honor and to save my noble family from disgrace i have terrible suspicions of your character and conduct the sight of you is as painful to me as a lamb to a man man with diseased eyes you are free to go wherever you want she is telling sita the world is open to you i have no more use for you sita how can a man born to a noble family lovingly take back a woman who has lived in the house of a slain man i am proud of my noble lineage how can i take you back when father has touched you and when you have live and his last few days have regained the reputation this is the sole motivation for rescuing you i do not want you any more you can go wherever you like this was what he was telling at the end of the battle when sita was brought back so what was sita nothing then sita had to prove her innocence as you know very well i don't have to tell the story by entering the fire and lakshmana says she has been tested by fire we can take her back so they do that but even them people of ayodhya did not forgive her <coughs> their suspicion still continue this is the landed culture rama must be very very enamored of her he brought her back and is living it there in the palace a woman whose pregnancy would not know how it occurred and that word was enough for rama to again decide to send her away and this time he would not even consult her or tell her just tell lakshmana take her to the forest and leave her there let her die well this is not the end of the story as far as rama is concerned women were not quietly taking this women did fight against it we do not know because they were singing these songs of ramayana for themselves in their own groups this is what i call the women's ramayana i don't know anything about it 
and you might want to read it if you like it. And there, when Rama decides that she should be sent again to the forest, all the wives, co-wives of Sita, the brothers, other brothers' wives, Lakshmana, Bharata, Shetrugna, all those people, they go to Rama and say, hey, you think we're all born in one family, married into one family? Our sister is not the only one who loves Ravana. We all love him together, so send us together. Because when Rama suspects that Sita was in love with Ravana, this is what the other women say, we are also in love with Ravana, send us. That kind of protest you find only in the oral Ramayana, women sing, I wrote an article about it and translated some parts of it, you can find it here. But that's aside, this is not the major story of Ramayana, everybody knows. Let's go to the Mahabharata now. I'm taking a big risk here. Mahabharata is a very complex story, with lots of layers, and in my mind, strongly Brahminized already. So, you have to go through several layers of it to find out what it probably was at one point of time. In any case, there is enough evidence even in the present Mahabharata that you have that it is a story of pastoral people. They fight for cattle. Remember Uttara Gokrahana? Cattle is the big property for them. Men are fighting for land. And when finally Pandavas want, they want only five villages, not any, any contiguous country. So in fact, Mahabharata has a lot of traces related to the cattle, cattle wealth, that's the major wealth. So I'm trying to look at it. Let us see the difference between Draupadi, the Draupadi and Sita. Draupadi is not a Patibrata like Sita. You probably know the story of Kichaka. When Kichaka, all the Pandava brothers and Draupadi were under cover, secretly living in Virata's court. Draupadi was there as a hairdresser for Virata's wife, Sudeshna. But then, there is this Kichaka, who <coughs> very much was attracted to and lusted after Draupadi. What does Draupadi do for the first time in the beginning? This he says, I have five husbands. All those Gandhars are very powerful. They'll kill you, Kishaka, don't come near me. Invincible, valiant, the Raya, <coughs> exquisite way equipped to destroy any enemy blinded by pride are my husbands. All five of them, Gandharvas, the bodies of gods. Listen, Kishaka, they will easily ruin your name and kill you. Depend on that. That was the threat Draupadi gave to him. But this Kichaka was very, very confident of the strength he has. He is much more powerful than anybody, so he would not listen to this threat. He still continues to bother him. At that time, he goes to complain to the king Virata. Virata is a very weak king, especially the Kichaka, his brother-in-law right there. He won't say much. But then there is Yudhishthira, Dharmaraja, now with the name of Kanku Bhatta. He very quietly says, good women should not behave like this in public. They should go home and take care of themselves privately. This is no good. So he was protesting in public against what Draupadi was saying about Kichak. Because Yudhishthira was worried that if they were discovered, they were just thought all over again, you know that, right? If undercover they were known to be Pandavas, the 14 years will have to all over again. So they are trying to protect their privacy, 
Nobody will admit that Draupadi is their wife. Draupadi goes to Bhima very quietly in the night. Hey Bhima, you know what brother Yudhishthira said? <coughs> what do I do? I have five husbands. All of them quietly doing whatever they are doing under cover and not trying to protect me because if they try to protect me, they have to accept me as their wife. That gives them out. And therefore, should I suffer? Is there nothing you can do? And Prima quietly says, look, just stay quiet. Don't fight in public. Go to Kichaka and pretend you are in love with him. Entice him to go to the theatre where the girls dance and where Prabhupada teaches them dance. <coughs> During the evening, the theatre is all empty. Nobody is there around. So tell Kichaka, hey, don't blast it out in public that you are in love with me. Come quietly to the dance hall and come yourself. Don't bring anybody. And I will be there. We will have a good time. And Kichaka was so happy. He said, okay, I'll definitely come. I'll come alone. Don't worry about it. I'll do anything you want me to do. And that way, Draupadi attracted Kichaka to go to the dance hall by himself where Bhima was waiting. Andrakar closing his face with a big blanket and thought, and Kichaka thought it was Draupadi. You know the story. He quickly kills him there. But my question is this. Can you ever imagine Sita doing this? Can you ever imagine Sita trying to attract Ravana? And then say, I'm in love with you, but don't tell anybody. And come someplace. Sita would not want to do that. You know that Sita was unwilling to go with Hanuman to Lanka. Hanuman says, shit on my shoulders. I'll take you without any problem. And what does Sita say? I can't touch another man's body. I don't want to come with you. But then you touch it, Ramas, Ramana's body, I was selfless at that time. But you, South Indian Ramayanas, don't even suggest that. They say, Rama lifted Sita from the ground she was standing, taking a piece of the ground with her and took her. That is, Ravana did not touch her. Even then, he kidnapped her. That way, Sita was protecting herself. Her only worry, if you read Ramayana Valmiki carefully, her only worry was whether Rama forgot her. Whether he would not come to take care of her. So she was constantly repeating and pressing to Hanuman, Hanuman, go tell Rama, he has to come here to protect me, take care of me, fight a battle with Rama. So we know that Sita is a different kind of Pratipata as opposed to Draupadi. I am suggesting it is because Rama, Rama, Ramayana is a landed epic and Mahabharata is a pastoral epic. The women are really more free. They are not as bound as Ramayana's women were. Let us go to Katha Sarita. The text, thanks to Asha, is made available to us in very much detail of the beginning. There is another Kathasarit Sagara also, stories from Kathasarit Sagara. We are going to translate it because it takes from ancient India. I am using both these books to talk about this. In the entire Ramayana and Mahabharata, you know one character that is missing? Is there any Vaishya there? All of them are Kshatriyas and Brahmanas, of course. But where is the Vaishya? There is a single Vaishya character in the entire Ramayana and the entire Mahabharata. Just let me take back that word. There is one single Vaishya character in the Ramayana. That is Sravana Kumara's father and mother. They are Vaishyas, all right. Only Vaishyas in the entire Mahabharata Ramayana. 
So what happened to this major group of people? The community or the society is made up of Brahmana, Vaishya, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra. Where are the Vaishyas? That's where you find in Kathasari Sagra. They are characters of Vaishyas. Now let's go to a little bit of detail about what happened in the Kathasari Sagra stories. You probably have all heard about Betala. Betala Panchamimshan told to you number of folk tales and also number of folk. Pick the books. There was this king called Trivikramasena. And a mendicant was coming every day to give to the king a certain fruit. And the king gave it to his treasurer. And treasurer un unthinkingly threw the fruit in his treasury. One day, the king threw the fruit to a monkey that was playing in front of him. And the monkey threw the fruit and painted it and the fruit broke and inside the fruit there was a very precious diamond. The king was surprised and asked the treasurer, Hey, what were you doing with all the fruit I was giving every day for you? Well, I don't know. I was throwing them in the treasury. Go and see what happens. And he goes there, the fruit are all rotten, but there are a whole bunch of diamonds which are shining there. And the king asks his mendicant, what do you want from me? Every day you are giving me a fruit with a diamond in it. There was something you want from me. What was that? And the mendicant says, very simple. And a dark night, a no moon night, you have to come to the burial ground and do what I want you to do for me. And you should come alone by yourself. And the king said, okay, I will do that. And the king, courageous as he was, went there. When he went there, you know the story, but I'm telling you anyway. He said, look, on the tree, there is a dead body hanging down. Take the dead body. Carry it for me and bring it here. And the king said, it's no big deal. I'll go there and get it. When he went there, he saw the dead body hanging upside down, put on his shoulders and started walking. And there was a, a vampire, a Vedala in it. That Vedala said, Hey, king, you are taking me very quietly. But I'll tell you a story to while away time. But one thing, the story has a riddle in it. If you know the answer and do not give the answer to me, your head will break. If you don't know the answer, that's a different story altogether. But you know something? The moment you speak, the dead body goes back to the tree because the Vedara goes back to the tree. So it happens 24 times. He was very patiently carrying the body. And every time the Vetara inside the body was telling him a story, <coughs> it's a riddle with a trick question. He has to resolve it and give the answer. And if the answer is given because king knows that the answer, it's a judgmental thing. Vetara goes back to the forest of the tree. In the end, there was a story for which the king honestly did not know what he was. And since the king was not speaking, he was carrying the body with Vetara in it very, very truthfully to the mendicant. Vetara said to the king, Hey king, it's going to be something dangerous for you. You know that mendicant is performing a ritual where he has to sacrifice a prince with no blemishes. And you are that prince. He will take you there, presents you before the goddess whom he is worshipping. And he says, prostrate before the goddess. And you know what you should do? Don't do that. Don't prostrate. 
tell the vendicant, hey, I'm a king. I never prostrated before anybody. I do not know how to prostrate. Will you show it to me? And the mendicant falls back on the ground and says, this is how you prostrate. And the king puts his sword and quickly kills him. And the goddess was very pleased. And the goddess gives a whole lot of powers to the king. And that's the story, the Vetala Panchat Shati, the 25 stories of Vetala. But for us, it's not the stories that are interesting. What kind of stories are they? The wrong stories related to judging something, property, relationships, or kinship. The Vaishya community, a trading community, want that kind of a king. They don't want a king who will be very ready for battle. They want a king who is judicious. They judge their cases very, very sincerely and give good judgment. That's all the property, what you call, rich people are interested in. Rich people do not want a battle to be fought. Because in a battle, battle rich people lose their wealth. So they want a king who should not be ready to fight a battle at the drop of the hat. They want a king who is honest, who is truthful, who is courageous. Of course, this king is courageous. He came in the middle of the night. <coughs> and a king who can judge your cases impartially and wisely. That shows that trading culture wants the kind of king that these stories tell us. The stories unfortunately are read for the fun of it. No, that's not the idea of the stories. The ideas are talking to what kind of king this culture wants, the trading culture wants. And you can read the rest of my Kathasari Sagara. You'll find very, very clear evidence of what this culture wants, what kind of a king they want, what kind of honesty they want, what kind of truthfulness they want and what kind of judgment the king gives to the like. That's why I say Kathasari Sagra, with all the fanciful stories in it, it is still a product of a trading culture. Trading culture people go away, distant lands, far away, and they come back with fascinating stories of those lands. And therefore they tell you fascinating stories. There are those fascinating stories. There is something else very closely related to it. It's not exactly in Vedala Nochukal, Prakhasari Sagra. You know the stories related to Sukashaptati, Amsabhivushati. Sukashaptati stories are fascinating stories. If you read them, you will never forget them. These are stories when a merchant away is away on his trading mission and leaves his wife alone. For a long time the merchant would not return. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the king of the raid area is attracted to this wife and keeps sending messages to her. Come to me. Your husband is away anyway. And the woman, perhaps she's alone, wanted to go anyway. <coughs> but there is a Shuka, a parrot. The parrot tells, hey young woman, where are you going? I'm going to the king. That's very good. In fact, I bless you. But you know something? If you're going to commit adultery, you know how to cover it up also. You have to know how to cover it up. Don't get caught. Not that you should not commit adultery, but don't get caught. Here is the story of Gary. And the story she tells, such a fascinating story where a woman very cleverly entertains another man in her house and the husband suddenly knocks on the door and she has to decide how to get away without being caught. All the stories of Shukha Shaptati are these stories. By this time the story ends, story ends, it's already morning. And she says, okay, you can go tonight, go tomorrow. Next day she is prepared again to go. And the parrot stops her. Hey, 
if you're going to commit adultery, right? Mm -hmm. You know how to protect yourself from being caught. I will tell you a story. This is also one more story. How very cleverly the woman commits adultery and gets away from being caught by her husband. All these stories of Sukha Saptati are exactly these stories. In the end, when the last story begins, the husband comes home. <laughs> so what's interesting about it? Here, for the outer frame, the woman is protected from committing adultery. But inside, the woman is taught how to commit adultery. <laughs> okay? That thing is not easily recognized. That actually these stories are teaching women how to commit adultery without being caught. They also belong to the same culture, the trading culture. The women in the trading culture stories are not only courageous, they can do whatever they please, but at the same time, they don't need a man to protect them. They can not only protect themselves, and they protect husband's character also. The husband is a way. They even protect the husband. Many stories are there in Katha Saris Sagara where a woman when the husband is away, number of people are attracted to her and they approach her and she says, okay, come home at 10 o'clock and the other person says, come home at 11 o'clock, <laughs> come home at 12. And all these people go one after the other and all of them were treated very badly and put there in a dark room. And next morning, king goes to the king and says, look, you know, this merchant has taken a lot of money from my husband and he's telling a lie. You know, those people who are in this pot, in this, what's called, um, in these pots, they will tell you that actually, this husband, this merchant actually borrowed money and is telling a lie. Anyway, I may not have told the story completely in theory, but she protects herself, protects her husband, and she's all right. So, women in Kathasari Sagara are not Sitas. They are waiting for the husband to protect them. They are capable of protecting themselves. They protect their character very well. At the same time, they do it with their own courage, with their own intelligence, and at the same time protect the husband also. So you have, if I will summarize, three different kinds of women characters. Indian culture has worship. It is Sita, it is Draupadi, and here are the women of the Kathasaris Sagara stories. What happened to all these stories? <coughs> which give a lot of freedom to women. That doesn't mean women should become prostitutes. No, they can protect themselves. They have the courage for that. They have the equipment for that. And they can do it themselves. Why did not decide Indian women are not only Sitas? <laughs> not all of them are Sitas, depending on the husbands to save them. They're capable of saving themselves. They're capable of protecting themselves. Why have we not given this kind of an open freedom to Indian culture saying our heroes, our heroines are different kinds depending on what culture they belong to. Heroes are the same. I'll tell you another epic. It is an oral epic. The story of Katamarazu. It is a pastoral epic. Not well known outside Andhra. Except probably my Mayan translation center. Essays I wrote about it. This Katamarazu is the king of cattle. There's a huge herd of cattle. And he lives in wilderness, grazing his cattle. You know, the interest of herders, they're interested in grass. They don't care whom the land belongs to. When they graze and the grass is gone in one area, they move to some other area. So they don't care whom the land belongs. They have only functional interest in the land, not a property interest. Katamarazu enters into a pact with Navasithu, a, Navasithi, a king there. And what was the pact? 
the increment is this. All the gas that goes from the water is ours. All the male calves that are gotten from the cows are yours. This was a mutually beneficial agreement. Because the king is interested in male cow, male calves. And the cattle herd was interested in grass. Sure, anything that grows with water on the land is yours. You can raise your cattle. Everything was going very well. But suddenly there was a drought. When the drought was there, Katamarazu started to graze his cows on the rice crop of the king. What was his argument? Well, rice crop is also some kind of grass. It grows on water with water. So that was the agreement. I was not begging anything. My cattle can graze on the crops. And there was a battle as a result. It's a long story actually. It's a wonderful story, the Katamaraja Katha. The whole thing is not translated, part of it, just here and there. And that story tells you the story of herding community. And these are the values of herding community. In a herding community, men could lie. You see, run away from battle. They could do anything they want, but win the battle. They are heroes. They can do anything to win the battle. That's not the Ramayana heroes. They would die there. They can't tell a lie. Whereas here, heroes can tell a lie. All they want is to make sure that we gain profit at the end. We win the battle at the end. That's also the story of the women. Their women can protect themselves. India is not one culture. It's at least composed of three different major cultures. The landed culture, the pastoral culture, and the trading culture. What happened? As a result of British coming over, Landed culture is given the highest importance. Why you can get land revenue out of that? They were not interested in increasing your trade. More or less they destroyed trade. And same is the case with pastoral culture. Because more population, you use more land for cultivating crops. And there's very little pastoral land left. <coughs> so in effect, what you have when India was three different cultures with three different heroisms with three different kind of women and what's right for the women to do we have made a single nation that we call Ramayana and said all our women are like Sita's timid waiting for the husband to protect them and don't do anything to protect themselves just wait there Make sure they do not touch the other man. That's all. This is not exactly what we should propagate among our culture. I do not know why historians do not write Indian history, dividing Indian history of the history of pastoral culture, history of trading culture, and the history of landed culture. I do not know why anthropologists do not produce anthropology of three different cultures. They did not want to see India in these three ways. I'm arguing to, with my friend Sanjay Subramanyam, who is a great historian, that you should rethink the way he's writing history of India. And this may be the way we are still arguing and talking and thinking. My point is simple. India is a very complex cultural country. And I don't have historical information to prove my point. But they have narratives to prove my point. Three narratives come from three different areas. Thank you, Arshia, for giving me the support. I'm going to start with um, Mahabharata because we believe that that's the oldest of these three texts um, and how it is a pastoral landscape and it has a pastoral set of values, very persuasive. Um, and the cattle raids, that are at the, in a strange way, the cattle raids, the one in 
the Virata's Kingdom mm -hmm. and then the one in the forest when we're in exile. And those are the challenge. You know, come forth, identify yourself. And I'm wondering uh, what you would say, you know, people like uh, Du Maizeu and Alfield de Battle and Bruce Lincoln, who are all um, Indo-Europeanists in a sense. And for them, the cattle raid is an Indo-European narrative phenomenon. And they argue that this layer of the Mahabharata is the oldest because it actually takes us back to a larger narrative culture and a larger culture of pastoralism and nomadism. Would you agree with that? It's a little overstatement, but it's still fundamentally it's right. This pastoralism is the major underlying what you call story in Mahabharata. There is, of course, a lot of dramatization of Mahabharata. You can avoid that. In fact, I did not bring it here. If you look at the, the family history of Mahabharata people, there's one side which is the other side, from which Kunti comes, Krishna comes. And the other side is not exactly a Yadava culture. So it could be that a whole group of Yadavas were married to those who are not Yadavas, who are not elders. It may be showing a bit of a conflict between these two groups. It's likely. I haven't thought about it yet. I just made a statement because I was persuaded that we have three different cultures, three different heroines, three different heroes, three different values, three different understanding of property, and therefore I was persuaded by that and wanted to make this statement. But yes, there is. So now this is making the Bhagavad Gita even more interesting. Yeah. Because if Krishna is a Yadava hero, and he's, you know, Arjuna, the great Shatriya, is asking him. No, we are, we are going through a whole lot of difficult problems. Was Bhagavad Gita something that they had done to Mahabharata later on? We don't know. Why was not Bhagavad Gita a part of Mahabharata in every other way, every version? Why was Bhagavad Gita become a separate book in itself? Which is our, our the, the book that tells us what Hinduism is. So there's a lots of questions related to the timing, <coughs> education, all that. I'm not willing to go into that. Definitely, Bhagavad Gita is a telling what is right for a landed hero to do. Mm. And Krishna is telling it itself. I agree. It's so interesting. The question that Arjuna asks is not, shall I kill? He says, shall I kill my teachers, my that's brothers, right. my elders? That's right. And that's a very, very different <laughs> question. As a Kshatriya, he has accepted yeah. the fact that, you know, uh, this is his job. And Krishna sort of refines his, yeah. his job as well. I don't want to go into that clearly, but one way of looking at Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharata itself for that matter, that happens when something very fundamentally different is happening in the culture. Earlier, there were groups of people. Now, you have a single individual in the family. So from the tribe to the family, a big shift has taken place. And you know what is interesting about the tribe? I'm going away from a major topic here. In a tribe, every member of the tribe is you. If a member of the tribe is killed, it's like killing yourself, it's your body. So people in a tribe, don't kill each other because they're all together. When you become a family, that's a different story. I can kill the other person. He may be my own uncle, but he was not a tribe. When it was a tribe, you pass my friend. Remember the early parts where Arjuna says, I cannot fight, my hands are shaking, my, my boy is falling from my body, and I can't really fight? You know something? It is something that a person would say when he is asking to commit incest. Whoa, okay. Say, say more, now you can't stop. Now you That's can't exactly stop. what a person who is forced to commit incest would say, No, my body shakes, I cannot do that. That's what actually I say. Which means it was a tribe, and the uncles and aunt, and cousins and all of them are one body. Like, now Arjuna is saying, uh, Krishna is saying, no, they're not going to You can kill them. They'll come again. They'll be reborn. It's like taking off a soiled shirt and wearing another shirt. That is nothing more than that. You know that. Vasam, Sivirjani. So the whole message of Mahabharata is given, sorry, message of Bhagavad Gita 
is given to you at a time when the culture is shifting from a tribal culture to a caste culture. And it's a very, very, very persuasive statement for me, but I don't want to go into it because that's not the major subject of my talk. I'll just make one more comment. In fact, um, Krishna tells Arjuna, um, you have to do this because this is the time of Varuna Sankirna, you know, when castes are getting mixed up, the fear is miscegenation. He says um, that. Yeah, you know, yeah. Arjuna's objection is this. Yeah. In a battle, all the men are killed. Yeah. What happens to women? They commit adultery. Mm -hmm. And Varuna Sankara happens. Krishna says, no, don't worry about it. Dead people are not dead. Okay? Death is nothing but just a transition from one stage of life to other. Like you take off a shirt, then sew it, and wear another shirt. The other um, cow or the cattle breed that um, uh, occurred to me is um, Vasishtha and Vishwamitra. You know, because Vishwamitra wants to become a Brahmanish. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he, the first thing he does is he wants Kamalini. You know, <laughs> from, from Vatishta, who is a Brahmanish and, and has this cow. Why well, you really got me thinking. Um, I will pursue this even if you want, but not, not, <laughs> not, not this evening. Not this evening. Um, I was also very uh, taken with um, um, your reminder to us all that, you know, the Ramana has always been subverted. Right, the misogyny and the patriarchy of the Ramayana has always been subverted by women. And as you say yeah, um, yeah. In, in their songs, and one of my favorite uh, Ramayana anecdotes is apparently um, in Eastern UP, there is a saying, don't marry your daughters to the men of Ayodhya, look at the way they treat their wives. <laughs> right? So, I mean, then, you know, we think that, oh, we're so cool, you know, in the 21st century, we're feminists and we're post-feminists and we can ask, Ramayana questions about misogyny, but not at all. Um, it, it's been recognized, um, obviously, by women, and it has been challenged um, over the centuries, really. Yeah. All over the centuries, women have a different kind of Ramayana, but among themselves, yeah, yeah. they're not contesting the public Ramayana of men. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting thing, actually. And not only that, the more unified as a nation we become, it becomes our national epic. Yeah. And once it becomes national epic, we think all Indian women are like Sita's. Stop the nonsense, they say. That's exactly what we're going to change. Give our freedom, the courage they have, and the pride they have in protecting themselves. They don't need men to protect them. So what, what else can we say about Rama? Is there a way that we can um, think about him more positively, not simply that he is an instrument of land and culture, that he becomes very much in Uttarakhanda, he becomes an instrument of Brahminization because he is he goes out of the influence of Atishtha and is now completely enthralled by Agastya, you know, who's telling all these stories. And the two things that Rama does in the Uttarakhanda, one is banish his wife, and the other is kill Shambhuka. Yeah. So and yeah. is Ram Raja is predicated on those two difficulties. Right. Yeah. And these are the these are the issues that give a lot of second thoughts to people who are telling Ramayana in Nehru version. Look at, for example, the Uttar Ramacharita of Bhavabhutiya. Look at Dimnaga's Uttar Ramacharita, Kuntamala. There, they find a whole lot of story to protect Sita and chastity and say, Rama, you have made a mistake. So my point is, when the culture was worried about it, right? Very much so, because even Kamban says that what happened to Sita after this, after the Abhishek comes, he says, I feel too bad, I can't tell you, it breaks my heart. And Raja Kapalachari, when he retells Ramani, he says, exactly the same thing. Oh, the women of our country, they suffer so terribly, I can't tell you what happened to Sita, right? So there is a, there's a real anxiety. There is, there is a worry, there is yeah. definitely a worry. But my point ultimately is, Ramayana is fundamentally a land and culture thing. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's why he has to kill Ravana also, not simply to get his wife back, no. but to yeah, maintain his reputation. Very telling yeah. words. Yeah. You know, self-translate is good for you. Yeah. And also in Uttarakhand, there's a Dikvijaya, basically. He does the Ashwamedha, and then he sends all his nephews and sons out to conquer the various... Um, there's a fascinating, fascinating story what happens after the horse was caught. Who caught the horse finally? It is Sita's sons, Lava and Kusha. And Rama realizes Sita was not dead yet. There are these sons, his own sons, and they caught the horse. 
and they don't let all the guards were there. You cannot say, please leave the guards. It's your own father. You can't take it. And Lava and Kusha protest, no. He has mistreated my mother, our mother. And he has to beg for forgiveness by falling on our feet. Here is Rama, he has to fall on the feet of his own sons, asking for forgiveness for treating their mother badly. And Sita was willing to go with Rama, but the staff, hey, you can't go with him. He was the one who really mistreated him. All the gods come with different kinds of things. Brahma says, hey, give, give your father respect and bow to him and give Sita to him. No, Brahma, you are the one who created Ramayana. You are the one who encouraged warning to Ramayana in favor of Rama. And the sun god comes. And they say, hey, sun god, you can be impartial because you are the family god of Raghuvamsha, of Ra. And god after god is rejected. And Valmiki himself comes and says, please listen to me. Valmiki, did you not write, write Ramayana in favor of Rama? I don't trust you. <laughs> so, the sons constantly reject one after the other and say, you are not impartial, you can't be there. We want to protect our mother. It's a, it's a fascinating story, okay? That's in Vivian yeah. Ramayana, it's in Telugu. Yeah, and Bhagavati actually tells Valmiki, I'll show you how to write a happy ending. <laughs> this story should have had a, had a happy ending, you couldn't do it, you made her go away, I'm telling you. So but, lots of, yeah. No, yeah. no, epic always has different tellings. Epic is not one. People use it in any which way they like. And retellings and epic, epic also tell you what the culture of those retailers of bees and what they are trying to protect. So we can't give one meaning for Ramayana. Many, many meanings are many Ramayanas. Yeah, the Kathakiri Thagra, um, as you rightly say, it, it is completely a charming text, but it's also a secular text. Very secular text. And, then, and yeah. it's an urban text. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know why Kathakiri Thagra was neglected. I can tell you the actual beginnings of Kathakiri Thagra. It was Gunatsha who was the author of Kathakiri Thagra. It's called Puhat Katha, a great story. He competed with Sarvavarma in his court. He accomplished that sort of basically very quickly. The king was playing games in water with his wives. And he was throwing water at the wives. And the wives know Sanskrit. And they said, Ma Modaka is Tadaya. Don't hit us with water. Ma Udakai becomes a Modakai. That's a Sanskrit term, Sandhi. And the stupid king who doesn't know any Sanskrit dad, they were asking for Modakas. <laughs> Modakas are sweet cakes. And he gets a bunch of sweet cakes. Hey, here they are. Man, king, who asked for Modakas? We are saying, Ma, Odaka is Tadaya, don't eat us with water. Don't you read his Sanskrit? And the king was very humiliated. He went and started wondering what you do. He asked for Gunatsha. Gunatsha said, Well, king, 12 years are nothing. It takes 12 years for me to tell, teach you Sanskrit. And Sharda Varman was in the same quarter said, No. I'll make the king competent in six months. And Gunatsha, hey, if you really can make the king competent in Sanskrit in six months, I'm going to give up every language that I know. Sanskrit, Prakrit, any language. And I'll just go to the forest and live there. When Sharva Varman really taught the king Sanskrit, People know that it's called Katantra Vyakarana. Gunacha had nothing else to do except to be. Goes to the forest and mingles with Pishachas, crows, and learns their language. That's Vaishaji. And then he has a big story to tell. How to do that? He cannot write. He doesn't have any writing instruments because he rejected them, abandoned them. So writes in his own blood and the leaves. That's the whole Bruhat Katha. 
And at that time, he decides what to do with this book. He said, send it to the king. He would like to publish it for you. The king looks at this horrible pages with brother and says, no, I don't touch it. And Gunachal sent this whole thing. King rejected it. <coughs> what does Gunachal do? He starts taking leaf after leaf, reading the story in it, and made a fire there and burning each leaf in the fire. And all the animals, birds and beasts, they were listening in rapt attention for the wonderful stories Gunacha was telling, reading leaf after leaf. And meanwhile, the king was not getting good meat. <laughs> Hunters were bringing him weak meat. The king fallen sick. And the doctor said, Hey, you are not being fed good meat. And they asked the hunters, Why so? He said, What can we do? All the animals, all the beasts are listening to the wonderful story that Gunanjan was telling them. Sitting, they are not hunting, they are going out to they don't have any exercise. And that's why their meat is cheap. It's not good meat. And King goes himself to see what was happening. King sees that Gunacha was burning leaf after leaf in the fire. They stop. By that time, he has burnt a whole lot of Brahad Katha and he was left only with one chapter of it, one last book. And that book was taken by the king. Gunacha was worshipped, honored. And then the book is available to us. That Bhukat Katha is not the entire Bhukat Katha. That was in Vaishaji. I told you the story because I mentioned it. It's a fascinating book. It needs to be preserved, translated, rewritten, and made what it really had been. And we have made it folklore. Please, it's not folklore, it's an epic. And that's what exactly was telling. Yeah, it's a great counter narrative. Yeah, it's got the, um, I said the three epics. For each culture, there's Ramayana, there's Mahabharata, and Bruhat Katha. Bruhat Katha is not extinct, it's not anywhere there. We knew until the 9th century the Paisaji book was available, but what happened to it, we don't know. We don't know this. But what do we have in Bruhat Katha? In, in Katha Sarit Sagra, there's seven versions of it. You have done Somadeva. But they should be properly translated, properly made available, properly interpreted, and given the credit they belong. It's not folklore. And the narrative of women, as you pointed out, is so strong. That's Very strong. Why, yeah, I think that's why it's been ignored because it doesn't fit our orientalist paradigm of all Indian texts are religious, all Indian texts are religious, and all women are, you know, um, should be kept. Um, if I have any, any chance at all, this is the message I want to give. There are three epics in India. Each of them should be protected, preserved, and talked about. Three cultures.